Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Could you all signal that you have those verses by just simply saying, Amen. 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 I'll begin reading. This is what God's Word says to us today. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out to the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Mm -hmm. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love. Know that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Well... The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, and to cause me distress in my imprisonment. But then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Amen. Yes, and I will. Rejoice. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And, and the tag we're going to add on this text is simply, In this, I rejoice. Mm -hmm. In this, I rejoice. Saints, during the, the first great awakening, there was a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. During his lifespan, is often credited by historians with being one of America's greatest preacher theologians. And I put the emphasis on being credited by historians as one of America's greatest preacher theologians because I believe Jonathan Edwards was a man of clay feet. And the reason I believe he was a man of clay feet is because Jonathan Edwards, as great as a preacher and theologian he was, owned slaves to the day of his death. But yet despite Edwards' clay feet, and despite him being credited by historians as one of the greatest theologian preachers that America has produced, Edwards' life wasn't exempt from difficult circumstances. As a matter of fact, uh, history records that Jonathan Edwards was fired from his church in Northampton and found himself in obscurity amongst the, Mo the Mohican Indians and the Mohawk Indians. Yet in obscurity, he used this time that he had to write some of the most influential books that are being read even to this day. Yes, books such as The Freedom of the Will and books such as The Dissertation Concerning the End for Which God Created the World were written during this time of Edwards' obscurity and are still required reading for many a seminarian student and shade tree theologians as well. And so in surveying Edwards' circumstances, one would think that the opposition that he faced in his lifetime would become a hindrance. Instead, the opposition, him being fired from his church, was an opportunity for the advancement of the gospel. Because church, it was Edwards who argued that the end for which God created the world was not human happiness, but his own glory. Well, it was Edwards who argued, since true happiness comes from God alone, even our own happiness 
is an extension of God's glory. Talk to me. And for this reason, Edwards argued that there can be no true happiness, and I would add true joy, unless our true happiness, our happiness, our joy is found in God. Amen. Amen. So if I could rush to summarize my sermon in one sentence, I would simply tell you today that saints, when we survey even our own circumstances, mm -hmm. And the opposition that we face from both friend and foe alike. We can have joy in our God mm -hmm. because we know that the adversity that we are facing is able to be used by our God mm -hmm. to advance the gospel. And so when we come to the verses that are before us today, we encounter a man in the Apostle Paul who even amidst difficult circumstances, could rejoice in those difficult circumstances. He wasn't uh, rejoicing because of the circumstances, but he was rejoicing in those circumstances yeah. because he understood that those circumstances were being used by the Lord to advance the gospel. And saints, don't you all know today that God is able? Yes, he is. He's able to bring good even out of all the bad that we experience in this life for his glory. Amen. So we ought to be able to rejoice. Amen. For we know that God causes all things mm -hmm. to work together for good or the good of those who love God and have been called according to his purpose. And church, you know, when I say all things, I really mean all things. I don't mean some things. I mean all things, the best things and the worst things that God uses for his glory. Yes, God uses our successes. Yes, God uses even our sadness and our, our doubts and our fears. He uses them all for his glory. Talk to me. And so Paul is often referred to as the apostle of joy. Mm -hmm. and we understand why he is often referred to as the apostle of joy because yes. uh, Listen, it's one thing to have joy outside of prison. Well, it's another thing to have joy while you are in prison. Mm -hmm. And so he got joy while he is in prison. And so understand, y'all, joy is about our relationship that we have with the Lord. Yeah, like, See, if, if, if Bill Gaither and Gloria Gaither and even... Richard Smallwood were here today. They would just simply tell you that Jesus mm -hmm. ought to be the center of our joy. Mm -hmm. Because all that is good and perfect comes from him. Mm -hmm. And so understand, y'all, joy is not about living for the American dream. Mm -hmm. Joy is not about the abundance of the possessions that we may or may not have. Yes, we are commanded in Scripture by way of 1 Thessalonians 5.16 to rejoice always. Mm -hmm. That is, rejoice in everything, regardless of our, pos our possessions or our predicament. And so our joy mm -hmm. can't be tied to this faulty illusion that if we get more stuff, my God. we'll have more joy. Mm. Because all of us in here who've done a little living very well understand that you may, we may get more stuff. We may be allowed to get and acquire more stuff. But even with more stuff, we will still find that true lasting joy becomes fleeting. And so understand this today, y'all. Our highest joy ought to come from delighting in the God who saved us well, as he uses our lives as instruments to advance the gospel. Well, See, this is the vision that the Apostle Paul had when we look at these verses before us. Again, Paul is chained to Roman guards. Mm -hmm. He's not only chained to Roman guards, but these guards are switched out every six to eight hours. Yet Paul could say in verse 12, I want you to know, brethren, my circumstances.
circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you picture that? Yeah. Do you hear those words? He's, uh, he's in what seems like an unlikely place to have joy, yet he still got joy. Mm -hmm. And so Paul says that uh, his circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And the word picture for progress is that of an advancement team. Mm -hmm. An advancement team that goes before Emperor's army by removing any obstacles that may be in the way that would impede the progress mm -hmm. of Emperor's army. So Paul is saying that his chains, his imprisonment mm -hmm. is like an advancement team. Well, an advancement team uh, that is blazing the trail ahead of God's army for others to follow behind him in moving the gospel forward. Yeah. Yeah. Our lives ought to be used as a means to move the gospel forward. He said in verse 13, he said, his imprisonment for the cause of Christ has become well known mm -hmm. throughout the whole Praetorian God. And to everyone else, and understand the Praetorian Guard, this, these wasn't like, uh, you know, some uh, off-duty security officers. These, these weren't like these kind of individuals. The, the Praetorian Guard were the elite of the elite. In our day, we would compare the Praetorian Guard to like Navy SEALs. Well. Individuals who go on special ops that we know nothing about. So the Praetorian Guard were Caesar's own personal bodyguards. Mm -hmm. Listen, the gospel is so powerful and effective in changing and transforming lives. Caesar didn't want to just send anybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, didn't want to, I don't just want to send any kind of guard to guard the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to send the elite of the elite to guard him. And I want these individuals to be switched out every six to eight hours <laughs> guarding this one man yeah. who has the power of the gospel in his heart and it manifests yeah. itself yeah. on his lips and through his life. Oh, Let me ask you, can you imagine what those conversations were like with the Apostle Paul as you were chained, to, as those guards were chained to him? My God. I mean, if I could use my imagination, I, I can imagine that uh, when the guards were switched in and out, that one guard would come in and they would talk to the Apostle Paul and they would ask the Apostle Paul, you know, how's your day going today, Paul? Mm -hmm. And Paul would probably say, listen, because of Jesus, All right. every day is a good day because Jesus is the creator and the sustainer of all things. And then six to eight hours later, another guard would come in and the guard would see the apostle Paul eating and Paul would use even what he was eating as a springboard to tell them about Jesus, who is the bread of life. And those who eat from him will never go hungry again. Amen. There will probably be another change of, uh, of guards. And the Apostle Paul would be sitting somewhere and just reading his word. And he would use that opportunity to speak about Jesus who was the word made flesh. Amen. And who Amen. made his dwelling amongst us. He would use that opportunity chained to that guard to speak about the word made flesh who made his dwelling amongst us and who died on the cross for us and who rose from a grave then became himself and who is returning again. So Paul used his circumstances mm -hmm. as an opportunity to share the gospel even with these guards. As a matter of fact, he must have been having Amen. some inroads because uh, what he was doing was actually subversive in nature. It was a Trojan horse-like in the emperor's empire because about time you get to the fourth chapter of Philippians, mm -hmm. 
Apparently, these soldiers whom the Apostle Paul was ministering to must have took the gospel back to their houses. Because Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, around verse 22, those in Caesar's household greet you. <laughs> so what that means is that Paul was using his difficult circumstances, his suffering as an opportunity to get still. Advance the gospel. Let me ask you today, saints, how are we using yeah. our suffering? How are we using the difficulties that we face in this life as springboards, as platforms to advance the gospel or share the gospel of Christ? Yeah. Because understand, y'all, we must see our suffering. Amen. We got to have a vision of our difficulties as being sovereignly allowed opportunities for gospel advancement. Come, 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 I'm going to say it again. We must see our suffering. Mm -hmm. We must have the vision of our difficulties as sovereign, sovereignly allowed opportunities mm -hmm. for gospel advancement. advancement. Mm -hmm. Listen, on the flip side, we can't see the difficulties that we face in this life. Amen. Because whether we choose to admit it or not, life is coming. Life yeah. is happening to all of us. Do so it. we don't get a get out of life hard times free card. Yeah. So we must not see our difficulties as God trying to make the best of a, out of a bad situation. But we must instead survey our difficulties as sovereignly allow opportunities to put the supremacy of Christ on display. Amen. Because beyond the fog of our circumstances, there is what John Piper called the hidden smile of God. Mm -hmm. Yes, beyond the cancer diagnosis, Beyond the asthma attacks, beyond the stroke, mm -hmm. beyond the heart attacks, on, beyond man. the high blood pressure, mm -hmm. beyond the sugar diabetes, beyond the loneliness, beyond the fall of marital conflict and difficulty, beyond the, the, yeah. the, the fall of familial difficulties and church conflict, yeah. there is the hidden smile of God. Yeah. So my question is for you today, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go for it? No, there's a cross for everyone. Amen. And there is a cross for me. Mm -hmm. So saints, let us not waste our difficult circumstances. But instead, let us use our difficult circumstances to rejoice in the God who is going to see us through. Come on, come on. These difficult circumstances. Because the truth of the matter is, this chapter in your life, mm. this chapter in my life, is not the final chapter oh, that's being you. written Thank regarding you. our lives. Thank you. Because the last time I checked, the Lord, the sovereign Lord of the universe, reserves the right to write, to he reserves the right to write a epilogue concerning my life and your life. He, he reserves the right to tell the final story in regards to how our life is going to turn out and how our life is going to end. Because of that, we ought to have a reason to rejoice. Amen. Because Paul did. Paul yeah. had a reason to rejoice because mm. not even his circumstances could keep the gospel from advancing. My God. Isn't that amazing? Amen. That it, it, regardless of what we're going through, Amen. whatever it is we're going through, none of that can keep the gospel Amen. from advancing. Yeah. So when we get to verse 14, Paul continues in that vein, that vein of his circumstances, his imprisonment turning out for the greater progress of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because in verse 14, Paul writes, and that the most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God really? without fear. Y'all see that? Amen. 
Amen. The gospel is advancing amongst soldiers. The gospel is advancing even amongst the saints whom he calls brothers. But, but notice Paul says most of the brethren mm -hmm. were motivated to, to speak the word of God without fear. My God. As a result of his imprisonment. Listen, church. We must never forget the messenger well. may be in chains. Amen. But the message is never in chains. The messenger may find themselves in chains. But the message of the gospel is never in chains. If I can make it more plain for you, I would say you may find yourself in a, a, a chained up predicament. Mm -hmm. But the message of the gospel is never chained up. We may find ourselves chained to some difficult health circumstances, but the gospel is never chained up by our hurt health circumstances. We may find ourselves chained up to a job that we perceive is a dead-end job, but understand, the gospel is never chained up, regardless of what we perceive our dead-end job as being. We may find ourselves chained a dead in relationship, oh. but even in spite of our dead in relationship, that we may feel that we chained up to the gospel is never chained. The message of the gospel is never chained to our dead in relationship. As a matter of fact, God can use what it is we are chained to. Yes. What we feel like we are chained to as a means to advance the gospel. Amen. Come on. This is exactly what he told young Timothy. Young Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, 8, and 9, Paul tells Timothy, he says, remember, remember Jesus Christ, Amen. risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not in prison. Amen. The word of God is never in prison. And, and understand this as well. We may, not, we may not ever know how the Lord is using our circumstances well, to give courage to somebody else. Amen. I would say that again. We may never know how the Lord is using our circumstances as a means of giving courage to somebody else. Oh, we ne we, you, you may never know mm. how the Lord is using your circumstances Amen. as a means to help somebody trust mm. in the Lord mm. with all their heart to keep, them, to keep them leaning not to on their own understanding. Oh but in all their ways acknowledging yeah. him because uh, we know he will direct our paths. Yeah, See, listen, can I tell you about Job? Job didn't know why God was taking him through or allowing him to go through everything it was that he went through. Mm -hmm. Yet, you know what Job said? Job said, though he slay me, mm -hmm. yet will I trust him. Listen, beloved, God is to be trusted yes, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. Because we are his followers, whatever circumstance we may find ourselves in. What we do know based upon the word is no matter how bad it may get, and it may get worse before it gets better, that God is with us. Oh, yes, he is. He's promised to never, to never leave us, nor forsake us. And so Paul says, most mm -hmm. of the brethren had courage to speak the word without fear. Mm -hmm. But then, in verses 15 and 17, Paul writes mm -hmm. some to be sure. Mm -hmm. Preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, mm -hmm. but some also from goodwill. He said, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Well. Then he says, the former proclaim Christ 
out of selfish ambition rather from motives thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Ultimate. Pure motives rather than for pure motives. Listen, so circumstances never exempt us from our critics. Amen. Circumstances, whatever it is that circumstance may be, it never exempts us from our critics, whether they be friend or foe. Yet, never forget this, that we need to rejoice in our God right. in the face of our critics, mm -hmm. friend or foe. Mm -hmm. Not because of us, but because Christ is being proclaimed. My God. See, there is no Christian who will be without critics. There is no preacher, pastor, who dares to stand tall behind the sacred desk, mm -hmm. who will be without their critics. Lord, As a matter of fact, if you're doing anything for the Lord, mm -hmm. you're going to have your critics. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's only those who aren't doing anything for the Lord who don't have your critics. And really, you know, that, that's, that's telling because, uh, listen, we can't find ourselves in situations uh, if we don't live for Christ, where we ultimately will have no critics. Watch out, watch because out. those who choose to live for Christ will always have critics. I don't care if they're critics from the outside or critics from the inside. If you don't choose to live for Christ in this world, you're going to have some critics. But Paul, he had his critics too. And his critics were fellow preachers. My goodness. Yeah. He says, Paul, he Paul says, some preached out of goodwill and love. Mm -hmm. In other words, they knew why the apostle Paul was in prison. Mm -hmm. They knew Paul was in prison for the cause of Christ. And they didn't use what Paul was going through for the cause of Christ as an opportunity to kick him while he was down. Oh because you know how folk will do it. Right? You ever been through uh, a bad situation? You ever been through a time in your life where it felt like your life was going through the south part of Gehenna? <laughs> and those who knew your life was going through the south part of Gehenna used that as an opportunity to, to, to kick you. Talk to me. They use it as an opportunity to kick you while you were down. But Paul said there were some that were not like this. Instead, they used it as an opportunity, as an expression of love and goodwill towards the Apostle Paul. See, listen, when we are living for Christ, there's always going to be those who are going to be for us. And there's going to be those who are against us. But yet the one thing we can be certain of is that uh, it doesn't matter who's for us or against us as long as God is with us. So, when we are going through a difficult season in life, people are either going to stand with us or they'll stand against us. And so Paul had both. They'll, they'll stand with us, stand against us by stepping on us because Paul said in verse 15, he said there were some that were preaching Christ out of envy and strife. Mm -hmm. It's right there in the text. Envy and strife. Envy is jealousy. Mm -hmm. And more about depriving someone of what needs to be enjoyed. Well. And there was some who had rotten attitudes towards the Apostle Paul. Talk to me. And so they were using his circumstances as a means to attack his reputation mm -hmm. because of his chains, mm -hmm. because of his position. After all, he was the Apostle Paul. But then there was strife. And, and strife is having heated contention. 
foolish quarreling, unhealthy interest in debates. Well. And, and there were some men who were preaching Christ for sure, but they were preaching Christ for all the wrong oh, reasons. My God. Don't you all know today that there are some men who are preaching Christ for sure, but they are preaching Christ for all the wrong reasons. Oh, man. That motivation for preaching Christ is not that Christ would be exalted, but they would be exalted. And listen, they may have their theological T's crossed and their theological I's dotted, but their motivation and their, um, their ambition is wrong. Mm -hmm. They were not preaching as we sung this morning the gospel full and free. Instead, they treated preaching as a cutthroat corporate ladder opportunity. And you know how it is in the corporate cutthroat ladder world where people will step over and step on anybody in order to get to the top. They'll make folk who are around them look small in order to make themselves look big. And so that's what happens in the pulpit a lot of times. You got some preachers who want to make other preachers look small in order to make themselves yeah. look big. You got some preachers who act like we in competition with one another, and I'm like, listen, we ain't in competition with one another. We've been on the same jerseys. Yeah. We playing for the same team. I'm not in competition with you, and you're not in competition yeah. with me. Only thing that matters is that, that, is that Christ is proclaimed. Yeah. Hence Paul says mm. in verse 17, mm. That they proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition because they wanted to cause Paul distress mm. in his imprisonment. And let me show you this. So the, the word picture behind distress is causing Paul more pain than he was already experiencing. My God. It's, it's, it's as if they were using Paul's distress and they seen him in chains, in pain, but they were tightening the chains. They were tightening the chains around his limbs in order to cause him more pain. Uh -huh. And so what was happening is, is uh, Paul realized that there were some individuals who were doing that. Right. But yet that Paul has this opportunity. Mm. He has this opportunity to proclaim the gospel regardless of his circumstances. And these preachers have this opportunity with, uh, that, that even though they may be doing it for good reasons or bad reasons, Paul is saying, listen, it doesn't even really matter to me because what really matters is so long as Christ is being proclaimed. Amen. And so the point is this, y'all. Listen, we don't always... Mm -hmm. When trying to get even with folk who are trying to cause us pain. And, and this was Paul's attitude when you look at verse 18 when he says, what then? What then? I mean, what really matters in the big picture of things? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. Mm -hmm. Stand on. He says, and in this I rejoice. Mm -hmm. yeah. In this, whether folk are preaching for the right motives or whether people are preaching for wrong motives, in this I rejoice. Mm -hmm. Whether, whether people are preaching out of goodwill and love for me or whether people are preaching to bring me more pain, mm -hmm. I will rejoice. And the reason I rejoice is because Christ is being proclaimed. In other words, regardless of Paul's circumstances, Regardless of how his critics were using his circumstances against him, he was going to be determined to rejoice. Mm -hmm. Rejoice because 
what matters most, regardless of what any of us are facing in this room today, well, is that Christ is proclaimed and the gospel is advancing. Mm -hmm. And so they were proclaiming Christ, the lily of the valley. Man. They were proclaiming Christ, the rose of Sharon. Mm -hmm. They were proclaiming Christ, the Alpha and the yeah. Omega. Yeah. They were proclaiming Christ, crucified, Christ buried, Christ risen, Christ the soon and returning King. And if Christ was being proclaimed, the gospel was advancing. Mm -hmm. For things don't have to go well mm -hmm. for us in order for us to rejoice. Amen. Listen, Amen. we can have joy mm -hmm. regardless of whether things are going well for us or not. Because our joy is not dependent upon how well things are are going or may not be going. Our joy ultimately has its foundation in God the Father, yeah. God the Son, and God the Spirit. Yeah. And our confidence and our joy is in them regardless of our circumstances. Yeah. So church, we can't allow mm. our past, mm. our present, mm -hmm. To keep us from rejoicing in the Lord. Amen. Because the reality is we all going to experience some ups and downs in life. Yes, sir. But we need to learn to rejoice. Amen. Amidst the ups and the downs. We all are going to experience some bumps and bruises. Yes, but we need to learn to rejoice in the bumps and the bruises. Yes, and as I draw near to my clothes. I want to tell you about two men who learned to rejoice in their circumstances mm -hmm. because it was the year 1555 in Oxford, England. And there were two men, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. These two men were burned at the stake under the, the reign of Bloody Mary. And as uh, the executioner came to light to the torch, which would be used to burn their very bodies on the stake alive. Hugh Latimer said to his companion who was being burned at the stake with him, he said, be of good cheer, well. Master Ridley, and play the man, hmm. for we shall this day, light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. In other words, he was telling Master Ridley, Nicholas Ridley, to be of good cheer in the face of this difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this suffering that they were experiencing was not for nothing. Amen. And I want us to know today that we too need to be of good cheer. Amen. Because the suffering, the difficulties that we are going through at this moment in our lives Amen. are not for nothing. Amen. Because in the midst of our circumstances, we got to learn to rejoice. Amen. Come on. Rejoice and keep on looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We need to look to him and rejoice because he's the crucified one. Look to him and rejoice because he is the resurrected one. Look to him and rejoice because he is the ascended one and the returning one who is going to return to receive those who have their hope in him, rejoicing in him on that particular day when he decides to return. And so, in the face of everything that we're experiencing, well, I want to encourage you to just simply rejoice. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. Amen. 
always. Again, I'm going to say rejoice mm -hmm. and look to Him through the many dangers and toils and snares we have already come. Rejoicing, forgetting what is behind us. Mm -hmm. Straining towards what is ahead of us as we press toward goal to win the prize mm -hmm. of the upward call of God Jesus. that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For this is true. Mm -hmm. The day that the Lord has made. Yes, yes. sir. The day for us to rejoice yes, sir. and be glad yes. in it. Amen. God bless you today. There is somebody here today who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Uh, today is the day of salvation. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Yeah. So the Word of God simply says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart yes, yes. that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Mm -hmm. There is only one mediator between God and man. Mm -hmm. And that man mm -hmm. is Christ Jesus. Amen. You want to know more about what it means to be a follower of Christ? Mm -hmm. Come and see me after service.